Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Nicole Lamberson. I trained as a physician assistant, and I am a member of the outreach team for the film Medicating Normal, and I host conversations like this one today. Our guest today is Tracy Dennis Tywari. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Tracy Dennis Tiwari. Yep, Tiwari. just about there. <laughs> okay. She is a professor of psychology and neuroscience, director of the Emotion Regulation Lab, and co-executive director of the Center for Health Technology at Hunter College, where the mission is to connect researchers, community stakeholders, and technology innovators to bridge the healthcare gap. As founder and CSO of Wise Therapeutics, she translates neuroscience and cognitive therapy techniques into gamified, clinically validated digital therapeutics for mental health. She has published over 100 scientific articles and delivered over 400 presentations at academic conferences and for corporate clients. And she's been featured throughout the media, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, ABC, CBS, CNN, NPR, The Today Show, and Bloomberg Television. So welcome, Tracy. I'm so excited to talk with you today, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Nicole. Um, really happy to be speak, speaking with you. I think before we get started, did I leave anything out of your, your no, I was No, I was about to apologize for that super long bio I must have sent you. <laughs> no, you got it. Sure. I do. Yeah. Oh, except, well, sorry, except uh, I did just recently write a book, so I should probably <laughs> plug that a little bit. Yep. Oh, you're so great. I never have it next to me because I think that's cheesy. You're so kind. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a future tense why anxiety is good for you, even though it feels bad. And it's really about reimagining and reclaiming the role of anxiety in our lives and really taking issue with how mental health uh, has been pursued uh, in, you know, in this country and really are, and I think it's so much dovetails with this, you know, uh, medicating normal, this wonderful doc that everyone should see and really, really re-examining how we mental health professionals talk to people and teach them and help them with, with mental health. So I think it's a very much of a piece. Yeah. Okay. So we're talking about anxiety. I have to admit when I was reading and researching and getting ready to have the conversation, I was a little bit anxious. Are you anxious at all right now? Um, uh, yes, but good thing. Okay. So we're gonna talk <laughs> <Yeah. about that. laughs> Anxiety. I, and, the, and it's really, you know, anxiety is more often our helpmate than our enemy. So it was, uh, I'd love to talk with you about that too. <laughs> okay, sure. So first, I, I guess I just want to know, like, why did you write the book, especially on this topic? What inspired it? As I, as I mentioned just a, a moment ago, I think I, I wrote this book out of that sentiment of uh, really as a mental health professional feeling a deep sense of failure mm -hmm. that I've been, you know, I defended my dissertation actually uh, about, over 20 years ago because it was on September 11th, 2001. Mm -hmm. That September 11th, I was there defending my dissertation, which made me an official, you know, clinical psychologist. And so as our world was falling apart with this terrible experience of 9-11, I was more committed than ever to pursuing this, this, um, this career of trying to you know, help folks with mental health problems, to try to create new and innovative treatment techniques mm -hmm. and really just, do, and I became a researcher rather than a practitioner. So I really just put my head down and wanted to do the best research possible. And, and over that 20 years, we, were, we have been doing wonderful research. There are great treatments out there. Um, there, um, you know, there are medications that for some people are effective. There are even science-based wellness practices. But when just a few years ago, when I kind of held my head up after, you know, putting my head down for so long doing the research, I looked up and where are we? We have great treatments, but somehow mental health as, uh, you know, especially in the United States is worse than it's ever been. Rates of anxiety disorders in particular, which is the most common mental health diagnosis, are on the rise, and especially among our youth, um, among you know, among uh, other problems as well. So I really wrote the book to sort of come to grips with this mystery of how can we have great science and great treatments, but our mental health is actually um, being eroded more than ever before, especially our experience of anxiety. 
Okay. So maybe just sort of to lay the groundwork for people, um, how do you define anxiety? And specifically, you differentiate it from fear and you differentiate it from worry. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so anxiety, and I also will add to that a distinction with anxiety disorders, which okay. is a really important um, point because we've conflated the emotion of anxiety with anxiety disorders. So when someone says to you, I'm feeling anxious, it's as if they're telling you, oh, it's, there's, you know, it's an alarm going off. This is something dangerous. And so I'll, I'll kind of end with a distinction uh, between anxiety and the disorders. Uh, so anxiety is future apprehension. Um, so a sense of apprehension about the uncertain future. So what does that mean? It means, you know, we know what anxiety feels like, um, you know, many of, most of us. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's the physical feelings that we equate with fear, you know, whether it's the butterflies in our stomach, the racing heart. So these are things that feel like fear. But anxiety doesn't root us in the present like fear does, where you're kind of handling, you know, you're re responding to a threat that's in the moment when you're fearful, like a snake about to bite you. Okay. Anxiety makes us into time travelers into the future. That's why I call the book Future Tense, actually, mm -hmm. pun intended, um, yeah. where, where you're, you're uh, thinking about this uncertain future, so that something bad could happen, mm -hmm. but it hasn't happened yet because the future is uncertain. And there's also the possibility when you're anxious is that your, your brain and your mind are perceiving that there's still the possibility of a good outcome. So right. anxiety is this emotion that's actually as much like hope as it is like fear, because it keeps us in the future, understanding that we need to avert danger, but we also need to work to make positive outcomes a reality in our life. And it prepares us because all emotions are adaptive. They prepare us and orient us and prime our body and minds. It prepares us to make the good outcomes happen and to not have the bad outcomes happen. So from that sense, anxiety is very far from this malfunction that we've sort of taught people to think of it as, or a danger signal. It's actually a sign that pre we're preparing to work for the future we want. Okay. And to distinguish that from worry, mm -hmm. so worry is sort of the thinking part of anxiety. So you can, you can feel anxious without really having worried thoughts, you know, those kind of ruminative thoughts going around in your head. Again, they should be future oriented. So mm -hmm. rumination is more about the past, like you're dwelling on the past. Okay. But worry is about the future. You're kind of trying to problem solve almost, trying to think, what do I do? What do I do about this thing that hasn't happened yet? Okay. And so worry is sort of the thinking part of anxiety. But you can be anxious without worrying because mm -hmm. sometimes we just feel sort of free-floating anxiety, right? Like, like something's off mm -hmm. or it's almost like your gut, your, it's that tummy test that something doesn't feel right. Or you're feeling a, a panicky feeling for no reason that you can really give thoughts to. So so that's why you can actually be anxious without the, the worrying cognitive part of it. Okay. And then you mentioned the disorder, anxiety disorder. How is that separate from just anxiety? Right. So anxiety um, is on a spectrum as an emotion of experiences, right? So it can be everything from a little tingle, a little, you know, a little tingle in your tummy all the way over to, to panic. Mm -hmm. But, and you can have this at the, all along the spectrum. We have experiences of anxiety all the time, even when we're just thinking about the future and are a little activated, that's anxiety. Mm -hmm. And we could even have intense anxiety every day, like way over on that spectrum, but not be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder because an anxiety disorder is only diagnosed when the ways we cope with those feelings of anxiety, wherever they are on the spectrum, those coping uh, uh, strategies, I guess, or those ways we cope are actually getting in the way of living life. So if I was feeling so anxious about this conversation, I was like, oh no, it's live. What if I say something wrong? And my way of coping with those anxious, so I could feel very anxious, mm -hmm. but I might still go for it and do it. I'm gonna push through and I'm going to realize that I'm anxious because I care about this. But if instead I email you this morning and say, sorry, I, I just can't do this. I'm, I, I have something that came up and I don't do it. And mm -hmm. then, another opportunity comes up and I avoid it. And then I stop going to work because it requires me to come into the office now. Those are ways of coping. These are avoidant ways, but they're ways of coping with the anxiety. If that started getting in the way of my life, of living well, of my work, of my family, of my friends, then you could be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. Okay. So, so the crisis we have right now, because anxiety disorders, a third of us will be clinically anxious in our lifetime. 
That's mm -hmm. over 100 million people in the US alone. The crisis is not that we're feeling too much anxiety. It's that the ways we're coping with it are not uh, effective and they're getting in the way of living a full life. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so we'll we'll get into that a little bit more, the, the coping and how we're doing it wrong, essentially. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit before that about how um, you sort of take an evolutionary approach to emotions. Um, I like that because um, I told you before we started the conversation that I, I took um, anxiety medication myself and I've since come off of it and had, you know, horrific withdrawal from it. And once I sort of peeked behind the curtain and looked at the way not only the mental health system is operating, but just all of medicine, I started looking a lot into you know, like evolutionary type things and diets that are based on our ancestors and that kind of thing. So I really love that in the book, you sort of take this evolutionary approach and you talk about how, you know, negative emotions like anxiety uh, get a, a bad rap. You know, I think about whenever we cry, immediately people are quick to be like, stop crying. You know, they want to stop this, yeah. this negative bad thing. And the same thing with, with anxiety. But then I also think like, obviously our bodies do these things for a reason. Right. Yeah. And so why do you think emotions are tools for survival and, and what is like the evolutionary role of anxiety? Yeah, this is such an important point. And it really, I, I think it is at the heart of what I'm trying to do with my book, because if these, as I argue, and, you know, from the time of Darwin, actually, it's not just me who argues this, uh, really Darwin argued this. Um, if emotions, we've evolved because they give us an advantage. What does it now mean that our whole approach to mental health is to equate mental health with the absence of emotional discomfort? with the absence of these negative emotions that we've evolved to have, that anytime we feel anxious, we, we think of it as a warning sign instead of a sign to say, oh, maybe my, my body, my mind, my brain, maybe it's actually I'm having this emotion because it's serving me right now. We've, we've been taught not to think that way. And again, this is on us mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, when I wrote the book to correct that you know the mystery of why we have great treatments and they're not working i think is because we have taught everyone the wrong things about these difficult emotions and these difficult experiences including most especially perhaps anxiety um, and and when you start to treat these emotions that we've evolved to have as malfunctions instead of highly functional mm -hmm. you actually that's when they start to spiral out of control that's when we, they actually, you start to lose opportunities to learn how to work with them and they, you know, and, and, and work through them and to actually use them to your advantage. And, and so then, and so then what happens unintentionally is they start to spiral out of control. You start to not be able to control them. You start to miss opportunities to see that when we're anxious, yes, it feels like fear and, it, and, and actually our biological responses are somewhat similar to fear, but anxiety, for example, does something even more it primes biological responses like oxytocin, which is the social bonding hormone. So that means that when we feel anxious, we're actually primed to reach out to people we care about in our social community, which is one of the best ways to seek support, manage stressors, and actually even regulate anxiety to, to make anxiety decrease. So it's as if anxiety in, includes biologically its own solutions. Um, anxiety also increases dopamine, the uh, the feel good neurotransmitter in the brain, which you know we think of that often or talk about it as kind of oversimplified as sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You have dopamine and it's addiction. And it's all, but dopamine is much more than that. Do dopamine is this little this little shuttle uh, um, among areas of our brain that help uh, integrate and and orient those areas of our brain that help us pursue goals that we really want, things that we really want in life. It helps our, when dopamine fires, it helps our brain work more efficiently to make our dreams into realities. So, so anxiety helps us by increasing levels of dopamine. So it does these things that because we've demonized these negative emotions that we've told people, oh, mental health is about not feeling these things, suppressing them. Mm -hmm. It's not only an opportunity cost to use them, but then it makes them actually start to 
become dysfunctional, start to turn against us. And I'll, and I'll just say, as a last point to really say, I'm not completely making this up. I, I mentioned Darwin talking about emotion. So when he wrote you know, his, his, um, his grand evolutionary theory, it was in three parts, right? Mm -hmm. So it was the origin of the species, descent of man. And the third book in his trilogy was the expression of emotion in man and animals. He literally put emotion, including all the negative emotions, mm -hmm. as a key. So what would happen if we started to think about our negative emotions as information or as activation or as um, kind of advantages that could help us? I think we'd start coping in ways that are actually more helpful. And then we do fewer of the unhelpful things, which is just to suppress and avoid. And that's what the medication and to kind of connect with the medication part of it too. We, you know, we think we, we should aspire to be comfortably numb, mm -hmm. physically and emotionally. That's what we mental health professionals and maybe the larger health industry has done. And you can't accept that as a solution if you also accept that our negative feelings, our challenges are actually part and parcel of being human. It's the messy work of being human, but a needed necessary part. So how could you possibly just numb that out for years at a time? You can't do it. It's not what we've evolved to be. Yeah. Speaking more about the evolution part though, in, in um, humans, you know, sometimes we become anxious because we actually have something physiologically wrong with us. Mm -hmm. So is that sort of separate from the anxiety that you're talking about? Like if my thyroid is off or if I have Parkinson's or um, drugs, I mean, I, I used to smoke cigarettes and I've never been more anxious in my entire life than when I was craving nicotine constantly. Yeah. So these are like physiological type things within us, but do you still think that is your body sort of sending you a message that something's wrong? I think that's a beautiful example of our body sending a message. Now the roots, as you say, are really different. And that's crucial because if you just say, ah, it's all mental, <laughs> it's like, that's not what I, you know, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But what I am saying, and really, again, it, you know, anxiety has a PR problem. And I feel like I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to repair the PR because okay. if you then instead say, well, wait a second, anxiety, it is, it could signal something really bad, but mm. whatever the case, instead of suppressing it, we have to listen to it. Right. That will be that just that one shift in attitude and mindset that it's not a malfunction, it's, it's information will mm -hmm. help you tune in and say, huh, I am feeling a lot more anxiety and it is when I'm craving nicotine, maybe my nicotine habit has actually become a little past my control. And this is me needing to listen to it like a smoke alarm going off. Yeah. There's fire here. Even if it's your thyroid, maybe having repeated anxiety, there's no rhyme or reason, you know what, go see your general practitioner. Say, this isn't, this doesn't feel right. But, but the first step has to be that you honor it and you listen to it instead of trying to eradicate it like a disease. Yeah. Uh, Tom, Tom Insel, who was the former uh, director of the National Institute of Mental Health, he recently mm -hmm. wrote a book and he did, you know, he's been giving talks about it. And he also gave a talk at the Aspen Ideas Festival. And he literally controlled, I think, $22 billion worth of mental health research funding for the decade or so that he was the director. Yeah. And he came out and said, and just a couple of weeks ago, and in his book, he said, the disease model of mental illness isn't working. It hasn't worked. It's failed. And yeah. we need new models. And the disease model is about you find, you know, it's like a, it's like the um, contagious disease model. You find the the, the, the disease, the, the germ, the malfunction, you fix it and you eradicate it and everything's good. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work for mental health. It doesn't work for anxiety. It doesn't work for you know, struggling through stress. It doesn't work to just eradicate these feelings we have. We always have to listen to them first and work through them rather than around them or, or, or suppressing them. Yes, so I just wanted to say um, that you know, there are a lot of people in the world right now suffering from anxiety disorders who, um, you know, and even some really great science shows can, can benefit from anti-anxiety meds like benzodiazepines when briefly used mm -hmm. and in combination with behavioral and cognitive therapies. And that's what all the science shows that they should be used briefly with very clear warning of side effects and, and, and possibilities of synergistic overdose, of addiction and all those things. 
but briefly and in combination with behavioral and cognitive therapies, mm -hmm. because benzos were never meant to be a lifetime treatment for 99.9% .9 of people out there. So I do want to say that I'm not saying to everyone out there, immediately throw out your pills and, you know, and I don't even think medicating normal is saying that. No. What it's yeah. saying is that we've shifted into this way of treating mental health concerns, complaints, mm -hmm. and illness to just immediately try to numb out what is actually healthy, normal human emotional struggle and experiences that we have to go through in order to heal. So yes. I, I do, I do want to, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. I did want to call that out. Yeah, sure. So um, you said in in a tweet that I looked at, at your Twitter. Oh no, that, what did I say? <laughs> that you think, um, you know, everything you've just said about medicalizing anxiety and that the disease model is is failing and causing harm, but that you said that you think the mental health industry is even predatory. In, in what yeah. way do you think that's true? I think, I think that at this point right now, there's... Um, and it's funny, I think the industry has this predatory um, aspect to it because there's big money in mental health. Mm -hmm. And certainly there are many pharmaceutical companies who are not taking careful enough notice of the damage that things like benzodiazepines are doing. Mm -hmm. So that when you put your profit above people's well being, when you don't fix what's broken about, what can be a solution for some people, you know, that is predatory. Um, a lot of therapists, I think, are extremely well-intentioned. I think 90, you know, I'm, again, we're in the 90s with what, you know, a lot of these are exceptions. I think the vast majority of therapists, of counselors, of other people really want to help. That's why you go into the mental health field. But there's also this industry that's grown up rooted in social media, rooted in you know, the self-help world, which is not always well validated, the kinds of solutions that people are pushing. There's mm -hmm. a lot of snake oil out there, but we are at a stage now where everyone is so attuned to mental health. Mm -hmm. And it's great when there's conversations about mental health, but I'm not so sure we're having the right conversations. Right now, it's sort of this, this, this kind of binary way that people tend to approach it. Either ah, it's like the old, just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and you just need to push through and, and you know, kind of still denying. Mm -hmm. Or there's this other side that is more aware of mental health, but now it's that, oh, any sort of mental um, or emotional discomfort, I need it taken away immediately because I've been taught that that's dangerous. And I, it, you know, and so there's this sort of safetyism around our difficult human experiences. So we have these two extremes mm -hmm. and I think this safetyism, this notion that, oh, as soon as you feel anxious, what are you going to do about it? You better put, get rid of it. You better go to that, you know, YouTube influencer or the IG, that IG uh, post, you know, person that I love or, or buy the, the, the 20th self-help book that's out there. Mm -hmm. I think that starts to become predatory, even if for some people it's not completely intentional. We've made people believe that they're vulnerable and they're broken and they can't trust their instincts anymore to make progress on their their own well-being yeah that's so true what about language i know you know just as somebody who used to be a, a consumer of mental health and medication i remember thinking like oh you know i'm safe taking these benzodiazepines because the warnings were for addiction but i was taking them exactly as prescribed and if someone would have explained the language to me properly that physical dependence is completely different from addiction your body can become neuro adapted to a substance without you even abusing it you put, you you know, wrote something about um PTSD and uh, language in, mm -hmm. I think it was Nepal. Mm -hmm. Can you tell that story and how, you know, how you think language is really important in this space? Yeah, this is, um, th this is, um, this is really, I think, one of the primary points I'm trying to make in the book that our mindsets and, and language is such a powerful part of our mindsets, right? Our, our, our sort of predictions about what the world is, how we make sense of it. It's not that you can just say, ooh, I'm gonna just shift my mindset and all my anxiety and stress are going to go away. It's not that simple. However, 
shifting how we talk about and frame what struggles we're having, it directly impacts the kinds of actions we take. So this was the story you're mentioning is that in Nepal, there was this group of mental health professionals who'd gone to, you know, really rural parts of Nepal to help people who are suffering from a variety of mental illnesses, including PTSD. And people had really been through significant um, trauma. And as they were trying to translate the words um, to communicate with folks in these villages, they used this word uh, that meant bra- that essentially meant brain shock. Mm-hmm. That talked about this brain illness um, to um, to the community. And in in the Nepalese way, and I think also in the Buddhist way, many um, Nepalese are Buddhist. In the way of understanding m- emotional and mental. Um, strengths and vulnerabilities, as soon as you start talking about the brain, it's a disease and you can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. Whereas other um, um, struggles of the of the mind and heart, they really talked about that way. They're, you know, my, my mind is troubled or my heart is troubled. Mm-hmm. And so if these incredibly well-intentioned researchers had understood the impact of calling it a brain disease rather than a heart problem, you know what they because what they found is that no one would come and see them for treatment. They had already given up on getting help for these very serious struggles that they were having as trauma victims. So that's just a kind of a small example. But what about the words we use for ourselves? Mm-hmm. When, so anxiety has become this sort of placeholder in the English language for like all these bad feelings. And I, I'm I'm a Gen Xer, so when I grew up in the 70s and 80s, that word used to be stress. So, you know, everyone, you know, if someone says, said, oh, how are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm stressed, but I'm okay. You know, I'm okay. Or, uh, you know, but it could be, oh, you're planning for your wedding. How are you? I'm stressed. But, you know, any uncomfortable feeling was stress. The problem with using anxiety as that new placeholder is that we equate it with anxiety disorders immediately. So if I say, oh, I'm feeling a little anxious about that, it we treat it as a signal to panic and as an alarm signal rather than as a signal for maybe what it really is, which is, that you care about what's about to happen because you're only anxious when you care. Mm -hmm. You can only feel anxious about this uncertain future that you're still committed to and that you believe you can affect change in. When we despair, we've, we've given up, but that's not how anxiety works. Anxiety means we're in it to win it still. And it activates us to persist, to be more creative, innovative. It actually, especially when it's at these more manageable, moderate levels where we become more kind of, Friend, we befriended our anxiety a little more. We've learned ways of coping. You can then wield it, even when it feels pretty strong. You can wield it in these ways that are much more productive. Mm-hmm. So when when you, I'm just kind of stumbling over a little bit when we get into the disordered part of anxiety. I mean, are are you saying that that is a true mental illness and that something is broken in people's brains or systems and people who are disordered? Well, yes and no. I will say yes and no. So it is a true disorder. There's no doubt. I've actually devoted my career to trying to understand and remediate and treat anxiety disorders. So I really wanted to be clear. I am not telling anyone out there suffering from an anxiety disorder that it's not real. That is the last thing that I would do. Okay. At at the same time, um, it's not an anxiety disorder in 99.9% of the cases, it's not a brain disorder that means you're broken. There's nothing broken. Okay. It is not counted among the serious mental illnesses in which you see a much larger, say, genetic, um, biological, uh, you know, factors there. So things like schizophrenia, you know, these are serious mental illnesses because there's a very strong biological determinant of that disease. We have no really good treatments other than medication at this stage, which is a problem, Mm -hmm. but it's a different category. Anxiety disorders have multiple causes. There's nothing broken in someone with anxiety. It's that they've over probably years, also perhaps in response to very intense life experiences, have developed habits of coping with anxiety that have gotten in their way. So that now, and those ways of coping tend to be characterized by avoidance. So you know, agoraphobia is, you know, panic and agoraphobia often go together because if you start having panic attacks, you start to feel, you don't know what's triggering them often. You start to feel afraid to go out in public because you could have one maybe out of the blue. And that feels very, you know, you don't want to be driving on a bridge and have a panic attack. And so agoraphobia is when you stop leaving the house. It's the fear of public places. 
And those, and but but the the key is not that you're having panic, even that you're having strong anxiety. It's that now you're you're coping and living a life in ways that it's not tenable. You can't have relationships, ha hold down a job, be happy and joyful, and be coping in these ways that aren't working for you. That doesn't mean that it's that it's your fault or that um, you know uh, life hasn't given you really hard knocks because so many people, I mean, and just through this pandemic, mm -hmm. so many of us have had incredible losses and stresses and traumas and the whole range. But what I believe is that while we can acknowledge that and, and acknowledge that anxiety disorders are real, that the key to of what to change is the coping. And that's what all treatments, that's what all therapeutic treatments do is try to change the coping. Mm -hmm. We can also say that when you still consider anxiety as still a normal emotion, that you can still have normal anxious experiences, even if you have an anxiety disorder, you will start to cope with anxiety in more helpful ways. You will stop avoiding as much. And you'll start to build the skills that allow you to live with anxiety in a better way. Um, I hate to throw out a, a, a philosopher right now, but Soren Kierkegaard, who was, you know, very, one of the, you know, they, he was supposedly the, one of the first existentialist, like, uh, you know, uh, philosophers. He would have denied that. But um, 180 years ago, he wrote. So I'm not in saying anything new. Whosoever learns to be anxious in the right way has learned the ultimate. So anxiety is a human condition. It's a feature, not a bug, and we can learn to be anxious in the right way. That's the whole goal of what I'm, I'm trying to say in my advocacy and also what I wrote in the book. Okay, great. That, make, that makes more sense uh, and clarifies that bit for me. Good, good. So I, I'm remembering back when I was reading the book too, you, you mentioned uh, when, we, when you were talking about eradicating all discomfort that we are as a society coming up with these um, places that are called safe spaces and trigger warnings. And we hear the term helicopter parenting or pr protective parenting. Um, and you, you say that shielding people and especially kids and teenagers from any emotional distress with these, these things that we've come up with aren't it's not doing good and it, and it can actually make things worse um do you want to talk a little bit about that yes uh this is really um i think this is one of the most crucial things we as a society uh, need to contend with because we have sort of gotten to this place again so much of it is well-intentioned i'm a parent i have a 10 and 13 year old yeah um we see this world around us. It is a mess. I'm mm -hmm. not writing any of this and saying, you know, I'd never say the world's perfect. Don't feel so anxious or, oh, you know, anxiety feels great. Keep feeling it. No, the world is very challenging. Anxiety sucks. No mm -hmm. one likes to feel anxious, but it is reality that this mm -hmm. is a, that this is a challenging world and anxiety is not going anywhere. We will never eradicate anxiety. And thank God, because it serves us in many advantageous ways. Yeah. When it comes to kids, we have to raise our kids to be prepared to deal with the reality of, in, in both of those ways. So I'll start with a little study and then um, um, that really illustrates this and then I'll, I'll elaborate on it a bit. So there was a study uh, with uh, coming out of Yale Child Study Center um, starting in 2018, and they've done replication since then, Elie Leibowitz and colleagues. And they're uh, at the Yale Child Study Center, they do wonderful intervention research uh, for childhood anxiety disorders. And so what they developed is this intervention that they've been refining over time called SPACE. It's called Supportive Parenting for Anxious Children. Mm -hmm. um, that's what SPACE stands for. And um, what they did in these studies is they brought in clinically anxious kids, kids diagnosed with things like social anxiety disorder, separation anxiety disorder. And typically with kids with anxiety disorders, you would give them, um, you know, you would administer cognitive behavioral therapy, which is one of our gold standard therapies that really gets at, you know, the ways that we think and behave that can, um, that can um, maintain and, and exacerbate anxiety. But in this study, what they instead did is they gave um, a large group of kids, um, they didn't give them therapy directly, they gave the parents therapy. And that's what space is. It's the, it, and what it did, this therapy, was to teach parents to stop over accommodating their kids' anxieties and mm -hmm. help kids work through. Over accommodating means 
If you have a socially anxious kid and they don't want to go to school, it's just too much for them. We have the instinct to protect them. So we're like, okay, it's okay. Stay home. It's all right. Oh, you want to sleep with me at night? I, you know, I just want to make sure you feel okay. And so it's this, this, this sort of helping kids avoid struggling through anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of parents of anxious kids start to do because we want to help. But that is exactly a recipe for actually making childhood anxiety worse. So space teaches parents to help them disrupt that. So now parents learn, I have to gradually help my kid get to school. I can't let them stay home. Mm -hmm. I can't let them sleep with me every night because they don't want to be separated from me and they're scared of the dark. I have to help them build those skills. So parents are taught to help kids work through rather than around anxiety. And in parents who receive this therapy, this teaching really, this kind of way of being um, parenting their anxious kids for six weeks, they then looked at their child, the children's anxiety. They then just saw, oh, how are the, the symptoms of anxiety in these kids? Mm -hmm. They had significantly gone down as much as the kids, a separate group of kids who just received cognitive behavioral therapy themselves, the best therapy we have on the market. Wow. So, and those kids never received therapy themselves, but they showed the same reduction in symptom severity. Wow. So what does that tell us? Now, it's not the parent blame. I'm a parent. I know I have a lot of parenting fails. But what it shows us is that if we really want to help our kids, we have to stop treating them as fragile. They are not fragile. They're yeah. anti-fragile. And that's a term that uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who wrote the book Anti-Fragility coined. It means that they're not like a China, kids aren't fragile like a China teacup where you, you drop it, it breaks into a million pieces. You can never put that thing back together again the same. Mm -hmm. Anti-fragile means these are systems, processes, you know, individuals who gain by being challenged. It's like the immune system. If you never threw germs and viruses at it, it would never learn to function. You'd be the boy in the plastic bubble. Yeah. But muscles, if you never actually strained and worked them, you wouldn't be physically fit and your muscles would atrophy. Emotions are the same. If we mm -hmm. don't help our kids struggle through and believe that they can do it, that they can actually go through tough stuff and do hard things, that they have to do hard things in life to be prepared. If we don't help them, we're failing them. Yeah. I, I'm imagining though, some people hearing this and thinking like, oh, well, you know, then you just sort of tough love and say like, get out there and do it. You know, is there a process of like a gentle way to, ex you know, um, expose people to things or to sort of push them without sounding you know callous and dismissing that it's hard it's mm -hmm. a difficult process for some people I mean there's no one right way to parent mm -hmm. um but I can say that throwing in the deep end that approach is usually not the best <laughs> as you're suggesting it's like a more um, but yeah. we also have learned through you know there's so many parenting experts and parenting books and the checklist if you don't check off 80 of the 90 checkboxes on the good parenting checklist you failed. There's so much of that mentality out there that yeah. we don't trust ourselves anymore. So what I'd say to parents is trust yourself, number one, that you know how to do this for your kid because every kid is different. Some need more gradual. Some mm -hmm. can just get a little like pat on the shoulders and a hug and okay, go for it. And that's fine for them. So trust your instinct. Okay. Also know that these are skills to build. Right. So, so skills are learned gradually. You wouldn't expect your kid to go out there and be a soccer star in one lesson. Think yeah. of emotions as skills to build. Um, and then I'd also say, you know, believe that your kid can do it and model for them that you're not always anxious about their anxiety. Mm -hmm. Model for them the times that maybe you've struggled with your emotions and come out the other side, right? And it's okay. And the first step in all of this is always honor your emotions, listen to them, don't deny them. They're mm -hmm. real in their information. Okay. And now what do we do with this? Yeah. You know, and sometimes it is just get a hug or have a cup of cocoa. But other times it's that, no, now let's get back on the horse. You know, so, so I think, but, but the step is always honor the emotion, model for your kids. Don't expect them to do things you're not, right? Mm -hmm. And believe that they're not so fragile that they also, you know, can't, can't handle things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't even think about that. The parents being, you know, if, if the parent is anxious or the parent is avoiding and that kind of thing, you can sort of pass that along too. I mean, that's what the space intervention shows in some ways that yeah. it's this, the parents, again, well-intentioned anxiety about their kids, anxiety that was actually leading to opportunity costs 
-hmm. and maybe some unhelpful coping habits in terms of helping these anxious kids through. Wow. Okay. So there's another concept you talk about too, um, seeking excellence over mm. perfection. What, what is the difference between wanting to be excellent versus perfect when it comes to anxiety? Right. So um, Thomas Edison, uh, the inventor, was a perfectionist. Uh, sorry, <laughs> no, he might have been, but he, in my mind, was an excellentist. There's this famous quote from him that says, I haven't failed. I've just discovered 10,000 ways that don't work yet. Mm -hmm. So that's excellencism in a nutshell. So perfectionism, it's toxic per because perfectionism by definition is this unrealistic, unforgiving standard of absolute per per perfection that we hold ourselves to. And so that anything short of that is failure. And you cannot tolerate failure because you have instead of a more growth mindset that you have to learn and fail and pick yourselves back up again, you're just, it's all about outcome. And I have to either be perfect or I'm, or I'm nothing. And so we know that perfectionism is toxic. It's unhelpful. It actually leads to worse performance. Mm -hmm. So you actually do more poorly when you're a perfectionist because you never give your chance, yourself a chance to fail and learn. Um, you tend to not know when it's good enough. So you, so there's diminishing returns on all your efforts. So you tend to put in inefficient effort. So there's all these reasons that perfectionism gets in our way. It also predicts higher rates of anxiety disorders, clinical depression, and even suicidality. So you know, perfectionism, there's not really many upsides to it. Yeah. Excellencism in, in, in instead is the pursuit of excellence instead of perfection, mm -hmm. knowing and knowing that you have to make mistakes along the way to get there. Yeah. And believing that you have the capacity to keep working and to make it good and then good enough and then excellent. And, and so it's this completely different approach to doing things in the world that has been shown not only to lead to better mental health, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but better outcomes. And people who are a little bit higher on the anxiety spectrum tend to be better excellencists. So it, it helps you persist when you face obstacles because you're anxious, you care about that outcome. You're mm -hmm. feeling that you're invested and that can feel like anxiety for many of us. You're, and, and also anxiety focuses our attention, activates our energy, helps us push through when we face obstacles. So in, my, in, in what the research shows and, and also I think in how we can conceptualize of excellencism, anxiety and excellencism go hand in hand. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then I guess sort of to wrap things up, I wanted to, to say, you know, how then if, if, er if anxiety shouldn't be eradicated, if we're not trying to be comfortably numb anymore, how then are we to be anxious in the right way? Like I'm thinking of ways that I cope with my anxiety and I'm, I'm like, am I avoiding, am I trying to, <laughs> trying to be comfortably numb or am I doing it right? Like going into my, my dark room and doing yoga and breathing type exercises yeah. or distracting yeah. myself on my computer or calling a friend. So or am I avoiding or am I? <laughs> well, doing so, so I would not know for sure. And I okay. would never presume, but um, you know, I very much wrote future tense, not as a traditional self-help book, but I feel like it's the meta self-help book because I think and I have this framework to kind of follow to answer some of those questions for oneself. Okay. And then there's so many great self-help techniques out there. There's great therapists. There's great so much. But you ha we have to shift our mindset about anxiety before we can benefit fully. So the framework I, I, I give in, in the last chapter of the book is really just three, three kind of pillars of how to be anxious in the right way. One is that anxiety to know and believe and try um, to be curious about anxiety because anxiety is information, so listen to it. That's just the first step, just developing that practice and those skills of just saying, oh, when I'm anxious, instead of immediately saying, okay, what do I do about it? Mm -hmm. The first thing to do is just listen to it and tune in. So there have been, I've been had a very busy past couple months and just a lot going on in my life. And there have been a few, quite a few mornings where I've woken up at 5 a.m., right? I'm sure many of us can relate to this. Mm -hmm. And my mind's going, and it's like anxious thoughts are going. And often our impulse is to say, oh, something's wrong with me. What am I going to do? I better just get up and like, forget about it. I'm just going to wake up and drink coffee and just like get into work. Yeah. But 
But what I try to do as a practice, it's not always easy because anxiety does not feel good. <laughs> but I sit there and I try to say, okay, what are these like free floating anxious thoughts telling me? So I'll kind of tune in and I'll say, okay, yeah, I had that fight with my husband the other day. Is that what's going through? Is that bothering me? And you're like, mm, no, that, that got resolved. And you're like, mm, what else is going on? You know, oh, I've been kind of waking up with stomach pains every day for a few days. And you're like, mm, no, I have the doctor's appointment. So that's okay. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, wait a second. Just then this deadline, I totally shoved it out of my mind, but it's in the back of my mind. And I think I need to start addressing it or dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And you're like, that's what I'm anxious about. Bingo. And as soon as you sort of give it words, mm -hmm. maybe even you get up for a minute, it's 5 a.m. You're like, I'm just going to write this down on a, on a list and say, email that person about the deadline tomorrow. Your anxiety will probably start going down. And it tells you, oh, I've listened to anxiety, it was up and now it's going down. That means I'm on the right track. Right. So that's just a small example. But when we practice listening to anxiety, we will gain wisdom mm -hmm. about what we care about in life, what matters, what we need to do. And then you can, from that vantage point, make decisions. Yeah. Now, the second step is kind of, I think what you're describing too, is that you know sometimes it's not giving us any useful information or we can't hear it yet, <laughs> or it's too much. I've had many times in my life, even just within the past several months where my anxiety was such a high level, I couldn't make sense of it. Mm -hmm. And I knew I just needed to leave the future tense because it was making me sort of like, oh, rah, rah, you know, kind of thinking, thinking, active, active, and I needed to come back to the present tense. Mm -hmm. So for me, I also am a lover of yoga. Mm -hmm. I love long walks. Like there are things that we can do that just bring us back to the moment when we can breathe again, when we can immerse ourselves just, you know, just kind of in a calm, maybe it's even just talking to a good friend, mm -hmm. right? Maybe it's, you know, reading a good book. Maybe it's, you know, whatever it is, we have these tools at our disposal. Maybe it is going into a dark room. And sometimes I just take a nap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just like, mm -hmm. I just need a, but to have that feeling of, wait, I'm not, I'm not in danger because I feel anxious. I just need to take a little step back and see what I need to do to get to a more of a baseline. Right. So, so sometimes we do need to be in the present moment in, in a deeper way. And then, you know, once we figure that out, then the third step is really, okay, if, if we have decided that anxiety is giving us useful information, the, you know, going into the present tense, sometimes it just goes away and we feel better and you're fine, but ah, the anxiety is still there. I need to do something with it. So the third step is really, okay, how do I hitch this anxiety to a sense of purpose? You know, how do I help it drive me to get that deadline done to, you know, I'm having this anxiety about spreading the word about why I think we should change how we talk about anxiety. What do I do with that? Like, you know, it can really drive you to do amazing things in the world. Yeah. You know, talk to a lot of artists and performers and creative people, and all of us are creative, but talk to any of them. And for many of the breakthroughs that they've had in their, in their endeavors, it's been at those anxious moments, at those intersections that are really uncomfortable where they've sort of dug into it and taken that, instead of suppressing it, avoiding it, not engaging or listening to it, they sort of helped it, that they used it to help them go to the next level. And so those are the ways that I think we can start to practice thinking of anxiety as, hey, we can actually listen to it. We can let go when we need to, to the best of our ability. And, and we can also use it in these kind of really productive and creative ways, just to make us persist maybe sometimes when we need to. And then you start to have a relationship with anxiety. You may find after that, that you, you know, I want to see a therapist. I'm struggling a little too much. I need that extra support. I need to, you know, I need to really devote my, I need to stop drinking alcohol because I just see that that's really spiraling me out and I need to take more intense measures here or you'll discover things, but, but you, you can use anxiety to actually tune into your inner wisdom and to understand what the right next step is for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all that is so important. I mean, I, when I was reading your book, I was like, oh my gosh, like there were so many things I was taught in school that wound up being so useless, you know, in adulthood and, and mm. growing up, mm. but things like this, so important that just to be human, like, I, I feel like we need to be taught as kids and even into adults as to be human. So it felt like this sort of missed opportunity for me. Like, I'm mm. so glad I'm learning it now, but having done everything wrong and followed, you know, the societal messaging of there's something wrong with you, you need to take medications, you know, and that 
wound up disastrously mm-hmm. bad, but just to, something so simple as to have been told, like anxiety is a part of life and you're going to have to like learn to have it in your life and it's not going anywhere and that it can actually teach you and motivate you and you can use it. That's, I mean, I think you're doing such a great thing with putting that message out there. And uh, I hope you can reach so many people, you know, with your book and your writings. So thank you. um, I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. Before we go, we have a couple more minutes. We didn't really get into, I mean, you you touched on medication some, but I guess, did you want to just leave everybody with some more thoughts on, you know, somebody has anxiety and they're considering medication for themselves or their kids. What, what would your message to them be at that point? I think, I think medication should be a, a, a kind of a more last option rather than a first option approach. Mm-hmm. Um, because again, we have, especially with kids, I'd say, but really any of us, because we have underplayed the, the dangers especially of benzodiazepines. They're very serious drugs. I mean, before that we had barbiturates, to tr- which were essentially tranquilizers to treat anxiety. So benzos for a long time were considered an improvement and we missed the fact that they're also very dangerous and risky. Mm-hmm. So I'd say, think of it as, you know, a very much of a second approach rather than a first line approach. Um, know that the way that science has told us, not the companies making money off of benzos, but what science tells us is the best way to use them is briefly over months rather than years Mm -hmm. and in combination with cognitive behavioral therapy Um, because, and its goal is not to numb you out and to eradicate all pain, but to just, if if you need them to bring you to a baseline so that you can benefit from these other treatments. So think of anti-anxiety meds and other meds as sort of, it's, it's the old Christian adage of give, you know, give a person a fish They'll eat for a day, teach them to fish, and they'll eat for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Benzos are the fish. Cognitive behavioral therapies and that are skill building, that teach you to cope in the long term, that's learning to fish. So focus on learning to fish rather than eating for a day. Um, And be very cautious with kids um, to not have that be a first line approach. Yeah. And I'll just add from as someone who took benzodiazepines long term myself, if you don't like anxiety, benzodiazepines actually cause, I mean, they caused me anxiety like I have never experienced in my life before. Once tolerance sets in and then when you have to withdraw from them, it is an anxiety that there's not even words to describe the physiological type of suffering that they can induce. So it's actually just so counterproductive. You know, you're trying to avoid and be comfortably numb and you wind up creating a state that is so much worse than you were to begin with. What an important point. And it drives people to believe they need the medication. Yes. Even more. It's like the cigarette smoking. Like I said, you're in withdrawal. And so you, you smoke again because you think you're, you're fixing anxiety, but you're really just squelching the withdrawal. It's it's so destructive. And again, there are a small number of people I think who really probably do need benzodiazepines. And, but I really become enraged when I think about what we've done, especially in terms of psychiatry and giving these meds out like they're candy. Yeah, it is. It is so destructive. I'm so grateful that this film Medicating Normal was made for that reason, because we because we have to shift our expectations and attitudes about mental health. We we have to throw out this disease model. If the former head of the National Institute of Mental Health says that the disease model doesn't work for Mm -hmm. mental illness and we need a new model. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, he was sort of an architect or a player yeah. in that model. I'm not sure what other indicators we need to say, you know, there are other and better ways to approach mental health. We have to build positive skills rather than always treat the struggle of being human as a disease to eradicate. We can, that's not what the messy work of being human is. It's just not, we, yeah. we can do hard things. We can be emotionally uncomfortable we can come through. We don't need safe emotional spaces all the time to survive and thrive. Yeah. That's a great, great ending there. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's been great to talk to you. And, um, is there anything you want to leave us with, or definitely I want you to tell people how they can find you and follow your work. And we also have someone who's going to put all of your social media in the comments 
and um, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll put it in the description as well. But oh, where can you. people find you? Sure. Uh, I have a website, drtracyphd.com. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, um, and um, Dr. Tracy PhD on Instagram, and Tracy A. Dennis on Twitter, because that was a long time ago. So that's, um, and, um, and, you know, I also write quite a bit for psychology today, and I just have a, a new article that just came up um, called To Heal Anxiety, Stop Treating It Like a Disease, which I think is, I mentioned that in particular, because okay. I think that's very much dovetails with our common uh, conversation as well. Okay. Um, and and, um, and information about the book Future Tense is also on my personal website, Dr. Tracy PhD. So yeah, thank so you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the, the promotional best. opportunities. I always, sure. I'm not, I'm not the best self promoter. It always feels a little, there's, that's just uncomfortable for me, but I push yeah. through. <laughs> yeah. I so we'll link, we'll link to the book too. If anybody wants to read it, I read it and it's great. And it's, you know, so it goes so much more into depth than what we discussed here today. So I'd suggest, you know, getting your own copy and it's on Amazon, um, anywhere else on your website yeah. too. Ev everywhere. Yeah. If okay. you go to the website, there's a, a page for the book. You can go to any of your preferred and independent booksellers as well. Okay. All right. So um, I guess we're just going to close. Thanks everybody for joining us for this live discussion. If you have not seen Medicating Normal yet, check out our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch for the many ways you can view it. We are putting the film up on more platforms as we speak. You can also buy the film on DVD if you're in the United States and Puerto Rico. Um, we're going to have more interviews like this one coming up. So on our events tab on Facebook, you can find those. And lastly, if you'd like to support our outreach efforts to bring the film and more conversations like these to communities worldwide, you can make a donation at medicatingnormal.com slash donate. So thank you again so much, Tracy, for coming and um, we'll talk soon. Thank you. It's been so great speaking with you. Thank you. You too. Take care. Bye, Take everybody. Care. All right.